Hello, I'm Ryan, and welcome to my channel, The True Connoisseur. And today I am going through a top 10 list, a personal top 10 list, an updated personal top 10. The internet loves these sorts of videos. As a way of discussing who I am as a fragrance and perfume enthusiast, I've been in this hobby for a while now, and I, I think I finally really settled into a place of, of comfort with who I am as a participant in this online fragrance community, with what my tastes are, with how I seek out and experience perfume. And top 10 lists, they change a lot. This is a particular point in time, I guarantee if you asked me in the heat of summer, this list would look a little bit different on the basis of the perfumes I'm enjoying at that time. This is not to be etched in stone like the Ten Commandments, but this top ten in particular, when I look over it, I feel really good about it. It, it, it expresses of the perfumes that I've sought out over the years and have some real deep kinship with. They're not necessarily the fragrances I wear all the time because fragrance is a lot like clothing. You may have a wonderful formal outfit, but it's not the jeans you put on to, like on a daily basis or go out on the weekends in. You know, there's a there's a place for the utilitarian wear of perfume, but these are 10 perfumes that get me excited about fragrance, that uh, excite something very personal in me, and um, I'd, I'd really like to walk through them with you. Some of these, if you've been following me for a while, you've heard me talk about some of these before, some of these I haven't ever discussed on the channel, but hopefully, um, you know, you'll find something here as I go through these that's a little bit new in terms of my attitude towards all of these. Um, the first of these, and I'm just kind of going alphabetical by house, so there's no particular order here. It's not going to build to my number one. There is no such thing, really. Um, this is a lovely fragrance, Apoteca Tepe's The Holy Mountain. Incense is a note that I've struggled with for a long time time, or or at least I did. Right now, uh, frankincense is, is really one of my most beloved notes in fragrance, but it was a, a challenging note for me for quite a long time. When I got into the hobby and was sampling, for example, the Amouage incense heavy fragrances, I found them very, um, very hard to come to terms with. Things like L'Artisan Timbuktu were very um, off-putting to me. I Something flipped a switch and uh, I'm now fully on board with it, fully on board with the sort of um, glorious, smoky brilliance of incense and perfumes, the, the wonderful character that it can give to it. But it's, uh, it's a note that I, I really had to come to terms with. And I actually came across the Holy Mountain not as I was searching for an incense perfume, though it is very much that, but as I was searching for a wood smoke perfume. Wood smoke is one of my favorite notes. It's a kind of childhood recollection. I love the smell of campfires, fireplaces, um, you know, the smell of, of smoke from a chimney drifting through the air on a cold day. It just fills me with joy. The Holy Mountain is a desert smoke incense. I mean, the name is, is, could not be more perfect for this fragrance. And I, I, I really haven't found a better interpretation of incense or of wood smoke in the sense of sophistication that it reaches. There are obviously fragrances that lean more into the campfire aspect, other treatments of incense that are interesting and, and uh, exciting. 
But in terms of this sort of sacred space created in this sort of dry, somewhat green landscape that's conjuring up in the name, it does feel very dry. It has that sort of wonderful effect that you get in fragrances like um, Andy Towers' Lair du Désert Moroccan, where it just feels like you're in an arid landscape. There's a sort of sweetness here under it all that isn't, isn't entirely dry, but it is green, smoky, and, uh, and warm in a way that feels contemplative. I, I, I can't say enough about this. I really think when I smelled this, um, in, in a shop, I just, I, it, it took my breath away and it still does even now. Um, whenever I, I, I'm very precious about when I wear this because it's just so beautiful that I, I don't want to wear it all the time. I don't want to wear it out. I love the experience of coming to it after a pause. Um, and it just instantly centers me. There are very few fragrances that, that actually do fully capture this, the feeling of the sacred, uh, in a way that this fragrance does. It's, it's really one of the most special perfumes I've ever smelled and deservedly is here in the top 10. The next one for me is, is frankincense again shows up as a through line in this fragrance though this is skewing more in the direction of leather and tobacco and tobacco is one of my favorite notes i make no qualms about that tobacco will show up in this top 10 a few times but uh but this is just a really special fragrance um it's it's carner barcelona sandor 70s Carner Barcelona Sandor 70s um, was created by Rodrigo Flores Rue for the brand. He's done a number for Carner Barcelona. And it is... Uh, it is such a dense, beautiful creation. Um, there are so many rich floral notes here. It's, it's really a, a perfume that's constructed of multiple leather accords and a suede accord and then this rich chewy tobacco and there's incense in there and it's dense and floral um it has a kind of like horse stable leather vibe uh you know it's one of many fragrances that is kind of evoking that sort of retro uh gentleman's club feeling but it's it's really not it's not a half-hearted interpretation of it. it. It really goes for it with gusto, but it's also just so well-rounded. Um, I've not really found anything else that kind of hits the same mark. Um, there are, uh, Rodrigo Flores Rue has other fragrances that use some of the, his same leather accords. He's used them in other fragrances, as well as this tobacco accord has shown up in some of his other pieces. But I really think of all his work that I've tried, uh, this is the one that, I would choose as the, the most impressively unique and structured creation. And it, it's very quintessentially me. It, not necessarily for the connotations of uh, the Gentleman Club. I've never really gotten that from this fragrance. I think of, of horse stables and, and um, warm leather in the sun and, and, and earthiness. Um, so for me... It, it, it's a little bit less of a uh, gentleman's club fragrance and more of like kind of like a a really sophisticated um, earthy outdoorsy leather. I don't know how else to put it. It's it's certainly not informal, but it just resonates with me so nice so much. Like I, I remember when I had the sample vial and I was wearing it, and I, I like to wear this on a warm day, even though it's a pretty dense fragrance. Um, I was wearing it on a warm day, and it just felt like the leather just kind of radiated off the skin, and it, it was a really spectacular feeling. Um, I really love Sandor 70s. I really, I really do. If you if you like tobacco and leather, and that's your kind of a, a thing that appeals to you, and you like fragrances that don't kind of go halfway with either of those notes, it's a good one for you. Um, Next up, we have Clandestine Laboratories Silver. Um, 
Clandestine Laboratory Silver is based around amber resin. Um, and the smell of this fragrance is, is very unique. It is a minty, cool, mineral, ambergris, slightly incensey experience with a bit of the creaminess and calming nature of sandalwood. It's, it's entirely abstract, um, but it's, it's almost cool to the, 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 the nose, like cool to the touch, like, a like a, like a cool stone surface. Um, it's, it's tremendously unique. I think it's, it's, a really special perfume and it's it's one I just wear for me it's one of those fragrances that um, I don't always wear fragrance you know before bed but this is something that I would wear to wind down or um, in a particularly anxious moment and I just want to kind of calm myself down I would wear silver it just has that sort of placid feeling um, it's 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 again much like the two fragrances that come before it, just very unique for me. I, I, I haven't found anything that really does the same uh, effect, and it feels so complete as a fragrance experience. It just, uh, it's, it's beguilingly straightforward, and but then very pleasant. And I think one thing I've, I've come to really love in, in fragrances is um, sort of minerality or a sort of saltiness. Um, this isn't particularly salty, but it is, it does have like a kind of like minerality to it. Um, and this is a, a good expression of the way in which my tastes have somewhat leaned t in that direction. This sort of, uh, uh not quite natural, but semi-natural vibe. And, and, you know, um, that, that sort of like ambergris breath burst of freshness that you kind of get in ambergris, it's so present here. I, it just has that wonderful unearthly quality, like you get in ambergris, like you can get in some uh, raw materials that just feel not quite of this world, but, it, uh, but nevertheless very tactile. Um, a really beautiful creation from perfumer Mark Sage of Clandestine Laboratories. Now, the next one is a perfume that's relatively new in my collection, all things considered. Um, and I, I purchased it uh, I, as a blind buy because of the name. Um, this fragrance is uh, Fuea uh, Biblioteca de Babel. Biblioteca de Babel is an ode to um, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, one of my favorite authors. Um, and, you know, sometimes you just gotta love stuff for the what it represents, as well as the fragrance itself. It is, uh, as it says, the Library of Babel is the inspiration of its scent, uh, a key, key reference point to the work of Borges. And, um, This scent is, is much like Clandestine Laboratory. It's very soothing and comforting to me. It does so nicely evoke the feeling of a library with old books. Um, it's not the only fragrance to do that. You could look at Darren Allen's um, vintage novel, which very nicely recreates more of that scent of like the actual old book. This is, has a lot of like cedar in it, so it's evoking like a full library. Um, it has that wonderful sort of like mellow, resinous, vanilla scent that you get with old books. Um, this, whenever I wear it, is, it's just, I, I, this ended up being a terrific blind buy for me because I just fell in love with it um, so completely. And part of that, again, is the association with it. I, you know, I, I think I've become more accepting of the fact that there's a lot of subjectivity in our relationship to fragrance. A lot of our um, love of fragrance has to do with connotations, both personal and 
thematic. Um, and I don't know. I just love, I would like this no matter what, though, I think. Um, I love the smell of old books. I love the smell of libraries. Um, and this just captures that so well. It's like walking in an old bookstore with with cedar shelves and, and those aged tomes. Um, a really, really artful experience. And it really, as far as I understand, is the fragrance in, on which that entire brand, which now has a vast uh, set of fragrances, is really built. It was the success of this creation that kind of um, really launched Foya as a as a perfume house. So I, I would recommend you check it out if that sounds uh, intriguing to you. Next we have something from the beloved house of Guerlain. Now I, I have um, somewhat come to terms with the fact that Guerlain is not entirely a house for me. I should probably do a video on Guerlain. I still own uh, plenty of Guerlain fragrances, but it, there there is a sense in which the fragrances that I, I was trying to love greatly have kind of, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that it's okay that I don't fully love Guerlain in the way that other people really, really love Guerlain. I'm never going to be a, a Mitsuku, Mitsuko guy. Um, you know, I'm never going to be a Le Bleu kind of lover, though I do, I do have a bottle of Jiki now that I love very much, so hopefully that gives me some some Guerlain cred, but uh, I, I do adore this. I adore this so much, and this is Bois d'Armony. Um, uh, again, the theme that you're getting with these fragrances is that these are fragrances that don't really have a peer. Um, Bois d'Armony is built around uh, primarily um, benzoin and, and that sort of resinous feeling, but it's almost, it's almost silky and liqueur-like here, especially in this, this formulation. Um, softened a little bit with vanilla, which is, you know, the Guerlain house note. And then, and then there's just a through line of, of iris. And I, I don't often get along with iris. The, the, the powdery dominant facets of iris can often, um, overwhelm me. I find that I can find it a little challenging. It's like uh, getting getting lost in a in a fog, which is one reason I've had you know trouble with connecting with you know a great many beloved iris fragrances. But this one, something about the warmth of the resins here, of the sort of uh, silky decadence of this. This is this is what I smell in my collection when I want to smell something that really feels like uh, luxury in a bottle. It just is just so instantly opulent uh, and in a way that is like very, very authentically opulent. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing try hard about it. It is just, it is just, sumptuous in every way. And um, I don't think Guerlain's exclusives have ever matched it. None of the designer exclusives from other houses um, that I've tried have ever kind of reached that level of just kind of exquisite luxury. Um, many fragrances try to market themselves as luxury. Very few smell like a luxury in a bottle. Bois d'Armony smells like luxury in a bottle. Now, the next fragrance for me um, was one I, I fell in love with in part because of the theme, kind of like B Bibliotheca de Babel. I'm not shy to say that, though. I, I think, you know, if it was just the theme, I would have tired of the fragrance with time, but I've only found it more beguiling. Um, and that is a sadly discontinued fragrance from L'Artisan Parfumeur, and that is uh, Seville à l'Aube. Sevilla Lobe is primarily an orange blossom fragrance, um, which is appropriate for Sevilla. Um, if you've ever been there, 
and I should say, I should probably not pre pre uh, pretentiously say Sevilla, if you've been to Seville, um, that sort of warm, orangey aroma is is the aroma of, of the city. But there's there's this wonderful beeswax and incense suggesting the liturgical facets of the city. It's a very dense, intriguing creation. It was uh, Bertrand Duchefort perfume, and few perfumers know their way around creating dense and peculiar perfume structures the way Bertrand Duchefort does. Um, and I was an easy mark for it, not just because of the theme, I love the city it's based on, but because of the uh, way it treats orange blossom. And orange blossom is, for me, again, another one of these very comforting notes. I could smell orange blossom all day, any day. Um, it's not the only orange blossom fragrance I like, but it is by far the most intriguing uh, treatment of orange blossom I've yet to encounter, um, because the way it just kind of blends it in, in particular with that beeswax, which um, I at one point in time found almost a little, a little challenging, the beeswax and incense note, as I've been kind of like dipping my toes into the, the waters of incense. It really... Um, it's a really peculiar creation. Usually orange blossom is blended with citruses to give it a very big brightness. And there, there are tart citruses in there with the with the, the orange blossom to kind of give it a little zing and zest, but it, it ends up being this very rich, and again, uh, as, uh, slightly sacred um, stew, right? It's like the Holy Mountain. It is evoking this sort of liturgical sacred space, but there's a little bit more hedonism at play there. There's a little bit more of that uh, balance of the sacred and the profane that exists in in its subject. And uh, I really, um, I don't know, I I think this stuff is magic, and I'll wear it all year long, even though it is probably too heavy for summer. I'll wear it in the summer and just let it kind of like boom out loudly, that sweet orange blossom. I don't know. It's, it's for me, really spectacular. Um, the next fragrance um, is a fragrance I love a lot, and it's from a house that I would rank right up there among my favorites. And I, I'm going to do another video on this house in particular. Uh, very shortly. Um, so I'm not going to say as much about this perfume as I want to, because I'm going to save those thoughts for a subsequent video. But this is Lorenzo Villarese's Atman Zaman. Um, this is the Eau de Parfum. I've owned the Eau de Toilette in the past, but I, I kind of switched over to the Eau de Parfum. Um, I've gone back and forth on it. It whether you like the Eau de Toilette or the Eau de Parfum really depends on where you want the notes weighted. Um, this is an Immortel leather tobacco in a aromatic Italian style. So again, tobacco, that's a note for me. But it's very um, genteel, very sophisticated. Again, in the same way that you're kind of seeing, I, I could point to a through line here of things like Holy Mountain Silver, Biblioteca de Babel. It has a kind of calming effect to the way that it's presented here. This is not a decadent tobacco. This is a sort of country house tobacco leather with a shimmering immortel coating. Um, it's really beautifully done, and I'll have plenty more to say about Lorenzo Villaresi in my video about his perfumery and that house. Um, next up we have another Italian perfume. And this is, of all the tobaccos here, uh, the one that is probably dearest to my heart. This is a perfume I fell in love with a long time ago and have chased ever since, which is um, Santa Maria Novella's Aqua di Cuba. Um, I fell in love with Aqua di Cuba through a decant. Um, and I had the opportunity to travel to Cuba when I was younger. Um, and that memory is now many years old, but it, it stayed with me as a, a sense memory. I, I got to tour the cigar factories when I was there, and the smell of that just left an impression on me. The mystique of tobacco, that's one reason I've come back to that note so often. But um, 
the sunniness and brightness of Aqua de Cuba. It is a bright, floral, lemon, honey experience with one of the most authentic cigar tobacco notes that I've ever smelled. Unsmoked. It's not a smoky fragrance. It's, it's uh, gentlemanly and sunny um, and bright with just the right hint of cinnamon and I don't know. This is this is a cheerful, gloriously uh, sophisticated interpretation of tobacco, and um, I don't know. This I feel a great kinship with this. Uh, one of the through lines you see here too is also, you know, perfumes that take me back to places, sense memories. Um, this this really evokes for me Cuba in a way that is. Um, very t tangible for me, um, and I, I really appreciate it. Sadly, that one, I think most of these are still around. Sevilla Lobe has been um, discontinued, but so has Aqua de Cuba. Aqua de Cuba was uh, recently discontinued. There's still some stock floating around out there, um, but uh, Santa Maria Novella has discontinued Aqua de Cuba, much to my dismay. Um, so... Uh, it's a precious thing, and I'll love it as long as it lasts. It's uh, a really, a really uh, singular treatment of tobacco. Next up, we have the fragrance that began my love affair with labdanum. Uh, labdanum was a note I somewhat appreciated, but um, hadn't had any direct experience with. It's not usually given a showcase. It's usually included and an amber accord and um, amber accords in the modern style tend to be very heavy on the resins and vanilla. They tend to um, soften labdanum's peculiar facets. And uh, this fragrance has been described by um, one person on base notes. And I always quote this whenever I bring this fragrance up, but I never, I can, can never remember who said it. His, um, they described it as scorched labdanum. It's a smoky labdanum. So I love smoky notes. Uh, there's no surprise in the fact that I would love this sort of dark, smoky um, labdanum, and that is La Couche du Diable. The Couche du Diable was a fragrance I stumbled upon almost by accident. I had no intention of smelling it. Um, but this evokes for me a few different things I, I love. It's, it's kind of got like a very dark stewed orange feeling in the opening. Um, kind of like a, a bitter Italian liqueur, the, uh, the category of Amaro. Um, so it's kind of got that sort of syrupy, stewed, orange peel feeling at the beginning. It could almost be a little Christmassy if the fragrance went in a different direction, but it goes for this black, dark woods and this wonderfully smoky, leathery labdanum at its center. It is utterly enigmatic. Um, I've since gone on a bit of a, a labdanum journey. Um, I tend to get obsessed with notes at a given time and kind of pursue those. You know, you, I've done tobacco, which has been a constant, um, persistent through line in my collection, even as it's changed over the years. Um, I went on like a frankincense bender, a neroli, um, orange blossom, uh, you know, different, different takes. I'm, I'm kind of shifting into a slightly patchouli driven phase, which is kind of a new thing for me, but, uh, labdanum, this is, this is the labdanum for me of all of them. I, I've, I've tried and owned this one is just a standout for me. Now the next and final one, um, is one I wear quite a bit. And I mean, there's always a debate with your favorites. Are they the fragrances you wear a lot or are they the fragrances that just, you just love so deeply? And you know, a lot of these I don't wear every day. I'll be honest. These are, you know, some of these I, I apply quite a bit. I, I, I do wear um, Aqua de Cuba a good bit. And uh, some of these others I've, I've, you know, spent some good amount of time in. But this one I, I have definitely worn more than the others. It's been a um it's been a, a steady companion. And it's one that I, I reach to a lot when I'm not sure quite what to wear. Um and it's a good fit for me and that is 
Tom Ford Noir Eau de Parfum. Um, Noir Eau de Parfum is possibly discontinued, though when I was recently over in Italy um, and in the uh, duty-free shops, I saw it everywhere, so maybe it's just been discontinued in the United States, much like um, Tom Ford Tobacco Oud and is still living its best life over in international waters, I'm not sure. Um, but Noir Eau de Parfum is essentially the Tom Ford remake of Javi Rouge by Guerlain. Um, and Guerlain has now come full circle, so if you can't find Tom Ford Noir and you're kind of curious what it smells like, if you can get a hand, your hands on the new um, Guerlain Abbey Rouge Parfum, they're in the same ballpark, pretty, pretty close um, in different ways. This is a slightly darker um, take on it than the current uh, Hobby Rouge Parfum, but they're both similar in the sense that they, they go heavier on that sort of vanilla feeling than on the aromatic greenery and citrus. And Tom Ford's version in particular is bringing over a bit of the sensuality of of something like Shalimar and playing that in the mix. So it, it's kind of a, a bit of Hobby Rouge with its sort of classic powdery vanilla and rose. But there's dark bitter patchouli in here giving it a slightly gothic air. And the vanilla here is, is kind of dark and it's slightly aloof but very warm and cozy in the same way, um, kind of like aloof, but when you come closer, it just kind of uh, feels feels like a nice caress. Um, it's it's my kind of fragrance. I don't know. I uh, it's a it's it's it was seeming less popular um, than some of the flankers, which don't really share DNA with it. Noir Extreme and now Noir Extreme Parfum, those sort of. Those were more um, Tom Ford taking a page from, I think, the success of Spice Bomb and things in that vein and kind of going in the Tom Ford uh, smoky dark direction with that. This is the smoky dark Guerlain, and um, the combination works really well for me. Um, because the Guerlains I connect with the most are in this lane, this sort of the Shalimar heritage. Uh, a little bit with Jiki. I never really got along with Hobby Rouge as much as I say that this shares that DNA because Hobby Rouge, um, there's always just something a little fusty about it for me. But this has the sort of warm, rich sensuality I want in that style of fragrance. And um, it's it's versatile enough to wear as, as kind of something approaching a, uh, a signature, at least in uh, cooler weather. So there you have it. There is a top 10 summing up my, my tastes as they stand. The kind of perfumes I'm drawn to are very clearly, you know, uh, I guess more off the beaten path picks in many choices. You know, some of these have been discontinued. Some of these, um, I don't think any of these are particularly hyped uh, fragrances. Um, some of them are well-respected. Bois d'Harmony is certainly, you know, beloved by the Guerlain uh, fans. But I, I, I find a lot of these are slightly off the beaten path, um, even when they're, they're associated with brands that have received a lot of hype and attention in the past. Um, and I, I think that speaks to the kind of profiles that I, I am gravitating towards. I'm gravitating towards... Um, denser structures, smoky elements from tobacco and incense and leather uh, resinous facets. There's a lot here that that's kind of my feeling. Even when I go for something citrusy here, you know, you see that I'm reaching for something like Sevilla Lobe. Um, now I have some more proper citruses. I love the Eau de Colognes. I have many proper Eau de Colognes, don't get me wrong, but I, I think my heart is really with the styles that these 10 fragrances represent. And um, happy to document that here because I think that's 
it's helpful for me to think that through and understand that about my collection. And it's also helpful for anybody watching my channel to understand exactly how my tastes are calibrated so that they understand, you know, uh, I'm not out here speaking for everyone else. I'm not out here uh, ever when I when I talk up a perfume, recommending it as it's uh, as if it's like a a no brainer. You know what 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 do, what do they say? Um, you know, easy easy wear, right? Like none of these are none of these are the none of these are those, but they're all very much idiosyncratically me and I am happy to own each and every single one of them. So thank you for watching this video. I look forward to hearing from you all in the comments, and I look forward to catching you in the next one, which will be about uh, probably Lorenzo Villarese and or uh, the fragrances of Italy. We'll see if I can fit both topics in one video. I may have to break them into two and distribute them separately, but uh, but that is kind of the topic that will be coming up next, and I look forward to catching you there.